Once again in recent times, there's been a bit that has popped up about the motorist versus cyclist debate. And we sort of try to remain relatively neutral about the debate, but it's pretty obvious. All the time I see cyclists doing things like deciding that red lights don't apply to them, or they can ride across crossings or decide that they're not going to wear helmets and all that kind of stuff. And look, I certainly have my reservations about the helmet law. However... It's the law and it's one of those things where we kind of think, well, okay, there are lots of things you have to do on the road that you have to obey. Whether you agree with them or not is another issue. Then on the other hand, you also see cars doing some really crazy things with cyclists. And people throwing things from cars is not uncommon. And in fact, we're about to have a chat with a fellow, Chris Singleton is his name. He's the executive chairman of Cyclic. That's spelt with a Q. And it has its foundations that go back to one afternoon in the Perth Hills. Uh, its founder, Kingsley Figart, was enjoying a late afternoon ride. And what happened? Without warning, from behind, he was hit with an object fired from a slingshot, what we would call a ging, from a passing car. Now, there's no doubt that there would have been a few choice words that might have left Kingsley's mouth at the time, but the incident certainly did not leave Kingsley. He thought about it for the next week or so, had a long conversation with his son, Josh, and came up with a rear-facing bike camera, and it was seen as the obvious solution. But, of course, there are some limitations, such as space under a rider's seat, and a camera-slash-light solution was the early and best idea. What happened then was Kingsley went to work and with a friend, a fellow by the name of Andrew Hagen, the development started on what was to become the Fly 6. From a crowd-funded start-up uh, to an Australian Stock Exchange-listed entity, Cyclic is now selling products all over the world. And look, it's fair to say that Cyclic itself tries to stay quite neutral in the us-versus-them debate, that is cars versus bikes. Their cameras are simply designed to make all road users accountable on the road, uh, plus cyclists who are often also drivers. We need to keep that in mind. Chris Singleton joins us right now. Hi, Chris. Hi, how are you going? Yeah, this is an idea that I'm surprised hasn't come up a lot sooner, but it's interesting what it captures. And I know, for example, we've got some photographs that were sent to us uh, that see some amazing things that people are doing. Uh, and look, I have to say, seeing people do crazy things on the road, we pretty well see that every day. It's another thing to see them recorded. And some of the things that both people in cars and on bikes do quite cl- clearly suggest that some people have not read Darwin's theory on natural selection. Uh, that's one of my favourite lines, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you're dead right. I mean, on any normal distribution curve on two ends of the spectrum, you've got cyclists who do stupid things and you've got motorists that do stupid things um and both are equally culpable in my opinion how much do you think this whole camera is helping modify people's behavior have we got to the point or do you see the time when we'll get to the point where somebody will consider before they do something i wonder if this dude's got a camera look i I think that's a positive thing that could come out of the, the cameras i know it certainly modifies cyclist behavior it's a common um, comment that I get from people who buy our product that they think twice before they do things. Um, so it's clearly modifying their behaviour and hopefully if the motorists think that they may get um, recorded doing something that's suboptimal, they'll change their behaviour. Is that the whole process? Was everything really about the story that we were told of Kingsley where he had this incident and that sort of got him thinking, I have to have something on board that can record what's happened so we're not in the my word versus somebody else's word scenario? Absolutely. He was shot in the butt by a slingshot in the hills and um, as you rightly said, there's a few things that went through his mind and stayed with him and he thought, maybe I can design a product that solves this issue. Um, And five years later, he's uh, has the company listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. It's been an interesting journey, um, but we're there. Yeah, it's an amazing thing, and I can imagine you have no trouble selling it all over the world because ultimately these debates, uh, well, they're not only debates, I suppose, that are had politically. They're also, if something happens, they're questions that become legal. And when you have the what, what they said, he said, he said, or she said, she said scenario, the first thing that happens is somebody says, well, okay, who do I believe? And, and look, sometimes, especially in civil cases, I guess at some point, you might have a, a judge or a magistrate who has to arbitrate, has to listen to both sides of the story and say, well, this person sounds more credible, what they're saying is more believable, they're more impressive as a witness, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, if you have some sort of evidence, 
that's impossible to refute. Well, this is what the person did. No, I didn't. Well, actually, here's the movie picture of them doing exactly what I've said they've been doing. Then it almost ends the debate and the argument there and then, doesn't it? Yeah, look, there's a couple of things that come out of that. Firstly, our cameras are used by the UK police force to enforce um, close park passing laws. And all the boroughs have our cameras and they do it right across the UK. Also recently in the UK, um, it, our footage was used in a court case and so now it's made common law that it can be used. We also have a thing in our cameras called incident protection. So if you have an accident, it locks the footage before and after the event. And what normally happens out of that is we've got audio as well as visual f- footage, is that the first thing time and time again we see is, sorry, mate, I didn't see you. When it comes to arguing the toss about who's supposed to pay for what, then suddenly I never said that. And when somebody's confronted with the evidence, here's a, um, some footage of it, it sort of closes the debate down fairly quickly. Yeah. And look, I have to say, I think sometimes when people say I didn't see you, that's actually not an unreasonable statement. It certainly also applies Completely to motorbikes. Agree. I mean, how often on the freeway? Look, I like to think I'm a pretty well motorcycle aware driver, mainly because I've had a few encounters with them over the years. But nonetheless, often they'll appear and you think, geez, where'd he come from? Oh, look, absolutely. I completely agree. And that's that's something that as a cyclist, you have to be aware of. You know, back to your Darwin comment, um, it applies for us as well as it does for motorists. Yeah, and I, I suppose as much as anything, it's in some way, do you think, going to go forward in assisting the debate? Because like you said, the one thing about these cameras, it's very easy to say, well, okay, if cyclists have them, then they're going to favour cyclists. Well, actually, they're not, because they're not going to discriminate between who they pick up doing the wrong thing. If the cyclist is doing the wrong thing, their own camera could actually be evidence against them. Absolutely. Look, I think these debates that crop up regularly and get fuelled by both sides of the, the spectrum, some people, if, if there's that famous saying about you can't reason with a person who didn't get to a position by reason themselves. Um, so those people are never going to be able to reason with. They believe something rather than thinking something. Um, and that's always going to be difficult. So hopefully people that think you can have a reasonable debate and both sides will meet in the middle and this stuff will sort of die down and become more common sense driven like it is in some parts of Europe some parts of Europe this just isn't a debate well once we have a look at well I suppose also people um, have to operate slightly differently in Europe don't they don't have as much as much space as we have I mean we tend to think of things being crowded here but it's a joke Um, whenever anyone talks about crowding in Australia it really is a joke because compared to other parts of the world we have lots of open space yeah look absolutely there's just there's sometimes on the maze when somebody buzzes past you and you're on a dual lane road riding in your the, the side of the road, there's a clear lane on the other side. And how hard is it just to hit an indicator, breeze past, and then move over? You just, people don't think. Um, in Europe, it's, it, they're just more cycling aware. I suppose it's just more part of the culture in Europe. Um, even the UK, there's just not even this debate. As, as, as and also, I think, there, I, think there, I think there are more facilities, though, and I think the uh, roads in Europe are better built to cope with them. There are specific cycle lanes and things of that nature, which we're only just starting to catch up with here. Oh, look, WA, you know, I, I travel around the world doing this stuff, and I've got to tell you that WA's cycling infrastructure is actually pretty good. I can ride from um, my home um, in around Subiaco to the hills, 53, 54-minute ride, and pretty well not have to ride on the road all the way out there. When I'm in the hills, different story. I enjoy riding in the hills. But, you know, we, we beat ourselves up about cycling infrastructure in WA. It's actually not too bad, to be honest. Yeah, but you've raised an interesting point there, which I suppose is a little bit separate to what we're talking about this evening, and that is the debate about, and, and you often see this, that you have some of those cycle paths and cyclists won't use them. And and I think that's a source of um, it's a sore point because apart from anything else, the amount of money that's been spent to construct them, and you think, gee, if you build somebody something, why wouldn't they use it? You know, it almost defies the whole build it and they will come scenario. There's a couple of things around that, and I completely agree with you. As a solo rider, definitely use them. As soon as you put a lot of riders on a cycling path, it, the, most of the things are principal uh, shared pathways. So there's a lot of runners and people walking, and even they have petitions trying to get us off those things. So often we're sort of not loved by anybody, to be perfectly honest. It's probably better described as a (laughs) cat-dog-mouse scenario. Maybe it's a bit like that. But look, I think at some point these are the kind of debates that we ultimately have to have because, look, in some respects, and when you talk about riders as a group, people who are riding along often these, uh, what what we refer to as a lycra brigade, in massive groups, riding in palatons all around the place, sometimes they're completely unwilling to yield anything. And I've seen some very, very interesting dash cam footage of 
bike riders who are just literally in a great clump who refuse to move over and are completely blocking a road. Well, I guess that's also the kind of thing that your Fly 6 picks up. Oh, look, absolutely. That, that's just plain ignorant behaviour, in my opinion. A set of handlebars is a, roughly about 42 centimetres wide. So if you've got people riding side by side, hood to hood, you're less than a metre in width. Average road is what? Uh, average lane is say three and a half metres. And the yeah, I think it's about, about I think three and a half metres is the international standard, yeah. Yeah, and I think a car's about, I think the average car's about 1.8 metres or so. Something like so, that, that sounds about right. Yeah, so look, if, if you're riding hood to hood closely and you look at people, you know, a proper like a brigade, they don't take up much room. But the lot that meamble away and are completely spatially unaware, that drives me nuts too. And even if I'm riding a bike, that mm. drives me nuts because you try to pass them and you're likely to get taken out. So mm. I think. Spatially aware cyclists and motorists, I think, are in violent agreement in in those situations, to be perfectly honest. Well, Chris, just to wrap up, congratulations on your product. Once again, we're looking at something that's been developed in Australia. It's been taken to the world. As I understand, something like about 40 countries have got your product worldwide. And I I just think it was amazing. You won a, a Gold Australia Design Award in the consumer electronics category against some of the international companies like Samsung and other big names. So I think you can be pretty proud with that. And once again, when we talk about, and on a slightly different issue, when we talk about a time when we lament the fact that we don't appear to be doing a lot in Australia, out pops this, and it's something that's happening internationally. It's something that we developed here that is now being used overseas and, like you mentioned, being used in countries like the UK. That's really good news. So uh, good luck with that, and thank you very much for having a chat to us. Pleasure. Anytime. Chris Singleton is Cyclics Executive Chairman.